Coming up on Tech News Today, what Facebook's new search engine really means. Twitter says, don't steal images from us news people. And Nintendo shuffles its deck chairs. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, January 16th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your last year's gadgets. Find out what your used iPad, MacBook, iPhone, Galaxy S, and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And uh, Aya Zaktar is in containment, as those of you watching the video <laughs> version uh, see. Uh, he's almost there, though. You're almost better, right? Yeah, 70 to 80 percent there. I'll, I should be healthy by tomorrow by the time Tom goes. So yeah. that's no. <laughs> that right. was your plan all along, wasn't <laughs> exactly. it? Exactly. It, it's, it's not a plan. It's falling bad, into bad. place. Uh, we're going to keep you up to date. The most important stories in the tech news, as we do every time, starting with the top 10 stories of the day with the news fuse. Facebook launched an improvement to their internal search called Graph Search, uh, which lets users type natural language questions and get results based on their friends' likes. The new feature is an invite-only beta and will slowly roll out to all users. U.S. Representative Zoe Lofgren is introducing legislation she dubs Aaron's Law following the suicide of entrepreneur activist Aaron Swartz, who was facing felony hacking charges. Lofgren's bill would modify the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to clarify that its definition of unauthorized access does not include access in violation of an agreement or contractual obligation, such as an acceptable use policy or terms of service agreement with an ISP, an internet website, or an employer. Leap Motion has signed a deal with Best Buy, where Best Buy will be the exclusive retail partner for the Leap gesture recognition hardware. You'll be able to pre-order the device from Best Buy stores and BestBuy.com in February, with shipments expected in the spring. The Leap will also be available at Leap Motion's website. Verizon's security blog published a case study today about an employee called Bob, uh, it's not his real name, at an unnamed infrastructure company who had outsourced his own job to China. Bob made several hundred thousand dollars a year, but paid a Chinese consulting company about $50,000 of that to do all his coding. The unnamed company's security team discovered this while tracking down the reason for VPN connections coming from Shenyang, China. Wow, Bob, wow. Google has invited those who signed up for the $1,500 developer edition of its Project Glass, you know, those really, really sexy-looking <laughs> spectacles, to a set of developer events dubbed Glass Foundry in San Francisco at the end of January and in New York City the beginning of February. Developers will have a device to use while on site, which is obviously pretty exciting. News outlets might want to think twice before running a picture from Twitter without permission. A judge found that the agency France Press and the Washington Post infringed on copyrights held by Daniel, Daniel Morell. Morell took photos of the devastation in Haiti following its earthquakes and posted them on Twitter. AFP argued that once Morell published the, Twitter, uh, the pictures on Twitter, the pictures were freely available. That argument was found to be false as nothing in Twitter's terms would allow that. John Scully is probably best known to folks in our audience as the guy who ousted Steve Jobs from Apple back in the 1980s. Tim Cook is well known for being a master of the supply chain before becoming CEO of Apple. Well, John Scully has some advice for Tim Cook. Scully told Bloomberg, Apple needs to pay attention to the price of these gadgets it builds because developing markets like China are really important. Thanks, John. Yeah, I don't think Tim had even thought of it that way, of so that. it's probably yeah. good that Scully said something out loud. AMD is taking one former VP and three former managers from the firm's Boxborough plant who left the company to go and work for rival NVIDIA last year to court. AMD claims that as they left the company, the four employees copied more than 100,000 confidential documents and trade secrets 
and took them. AMD wants to recover the files, which the company claims covers everything from upcoming technology and contracts with large and enterprise customers. The suit was filed in the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts. StopTheCap.com and groups like Public Knowledge are upset at AT&T for exempting its own traffic from its data caps. On AT&T's FAC, it notes that if you use a microcell from AT&T, the data sent from it will not count against your data cap on your AT&T internet connection. Microcells allow you to use your internet connection to route cell phone calls when you're in your house if you don't have good cell coverage in your house. Uh, the issue is that similar products from competing mobile carriers would not be exempt, and organizations like Public Knowledge say this violates the principle of net neutrality. Apple has confirmed with All Things D that Apple's VP of Retail, Jerry McDougal, will be leaving Apple as of this Friday. McDougal's departure is attributed to him wanting to spend more time with his family and is not about Apple removing its last senior VP of Retail, John Browett. The new VP of Retail will be Jim Bean, who was previously an Apple VP of Finance. Uh, I used to, used to, wait, no, we'll say it again. Not Jim Beam. Bean, like, okay. like the, the food. Not, uh, not Jim Beam, like the drink. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. Did you get a new iPhone for Christmas? Maybe a Samsung Galaxy S for Hanukkah? Uh, maybe you were really good, got a new iPad or a new MacBook over the holidays. Well, before you give away or bury last year's gadget in a drawer, find out what it's worth at gazelle.com. The extra cash you can get is the gift to give yourself. Your New Year's resolution. Be nice to yourself. Gazelle makes selling last year's gadgets fast and simple. Go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot -E com. Tell Gazelle the condition of the gadget. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. So be honest. Uh, get a risk-free offer for your gadget. Lock it in for 30 days. Then you get paid fast by check or PayPal once you send your gadget back. Go to gazelle.com. Get that offer for your iPhone, your Android, your BlackBerry phone, your iPad, or other Apple products. And do it today because gadgets... They, they don't get more valuable every day. They probably lose value every day. And with Gazelle, you get paid in cash. Payments fast within a few days of the item being received. Offers are good for 30 days, giving you time to transfer your data, set up your current device. And then Gazelle will wipe your data for free. Uh, if 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 you uh, if if you wipe it yourself, they'll wipe it again. It's it's trustworthy. Gazelle has paid fifty million dollars to over five hundred thousand customers. It's easy, free shipping. Most items qualify for a free box uh, and fast fast processing. No listing hassles. So, sell your last year's gadgets today at Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, joining us to discuss the stories of the day, we're happy to have Scott Budman, business and tech reporter for NBC in the Bay Area. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks very much. Always glad to be here. How are you guys doing? Uh, it's great to have you. Joining us from the newsroom, I see. Yes, from the uh, NBC newsroom. So I'm trying to get a shot that's not all, <laughs> you know, halogen lights or anything like that. All right. Well, good. Hopefully we'll get a little uh, nat natural sound of the news uh, happening in the background. Yes. <laughs> Let's start with the uh, the Facebook uh, graph search uh, that we, we covered this yesterday as it was breaking on Tech News Today. Uh, it finds answers based on trusted sources. Uh, this is different than Google search, right? Google search finds answers right. based on all sources. Ironically, Sarah, this is Facebook taking advantage of the fact that they have more privacy. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know if, if you guys have already seen this, but there are uh, there are already situations where people would say, you know, if you were trying to filter uh, via your friend list, you've got 500 friends or whatever. Oh, you know, let's filter by people who live in this city or people who work at this company. Sometimes people can say that they live somewhere or work somewhere, and it has absolutely no bearing on fact. So this is sort of, as far as I can see, it's a really great idea in theory, but it's really easy to hack around it and end up in search results, which is very counterintuitive to what Facebook should be doing. Yeah, um, it was funny. Charles wrote in an email to us. He's like, what about all those people who like the hamburger shop to get a you know 20% discount on hamburgers? Do they really like that hamburger shop? The graph search is going to act as if they do. Wired has a really good story up today of, of Lars Rasmussen, formerly of Google. He was the man behind Google Maps and Google Wave. So winning a, win a not-so-win in his background. Uh, he helped build this with ex-Googler Tom Stocky. So there's a lot of Google experience behind this search engine. They actually built a semantic search. It doesn't rely on keywords. Uh, what do you think of this, Scott? You've had a, you've had a day to digest this news. Uh, what kind of product is this? How many people are going to use it? What's it good for? I think it's kind of interesting, uh, Tom. I had a chance to try it and have been playing with it a little bit. And it's interesting. And it is, you know, Sarah's right. It's not Google. 
and it comes with all the caveats that you have with Facebook. You don't really know who's telling the truth necessarily uh, about a product or about themselves or about their job. But it is something I think that Facebook really, really needed. You know, you've got more than a billion people, all this information, and no way to really bring the two together. And so this allows them both to help you find things. So often people have told me, oh, I heard about something on Facebook and then went to Google or Twitter to search for information about it. This lets you stay in one place. And also, of course, this could benefit Facebook's bottom line by letting advertisers know more about you or about what you are putting on Facebook. So it's something that they needed. Uh, don't know how much of a game changer it'll be, but if it keeps people on Facebook for a little bit longer, that's something they definitely would like. Yeah, you know, I think sure. I, I think I heard something. Someone had uh, it was tr was trying to break down. Okay, what's the difference between what Facebook could offer here and what Google could offer? Because they're not the same kind of search. And in Facebook's case, at least right now, it's what people have already done. Mm -hmm. It is what you are presently or what you have been in the past. And with Google, in many cases, you search for what you might want to have in the future, what might be the case down the road. And so that's fundamentally two very different things. Yeah, it's interesting. All Things D uh, pointed out that yesterday, Google stock took a spike during the Facebook announcement. And then it kind of came right back to where it had been. But it really didn't seem to suffer at all mm -hmm. from this. Whereas Yelp stock took a dive. Uh, not a horrible dive, but it definitely took a hit. And it seems like the stock market is saying, we think this is a competitor for recommendation engines like Yelp. Ayaz, what do you think? Well, I think the reason why Google didn't really get hit by this at all is because Google has been shut out of Facebook results and scraping Facebook data for a while. Uh, Facebook data is uh, visible via Bing, and Microsoft has a good deal with Facebook to keep that going. So I don't think Google directly is impacted by this. But for Yelp, and basically just finding out uh, what your friends like. And, and instead of looking at anonymous data theoretically with Yelp and not knowing everybody, I think that Facebook has, they're in a really good position to take over that recommendation market. And I got to say, one of the nicest things I saw about that search we were seeing yesterday is that they figure out a way to do a natural language search. I mean, a lot of us have become search ninjas, right? You just throw in a bunch of terms in, an, in a very unnatural, non-English way of searching. But Facebook seems to have figured out a way to properly do it where you could just write friends that are in this area that like this kind of food, and the search does all the work for you instead of you figuring out how the search works. Now, one of the things is this is a nifty trick of engineering, and because of that, they're rolling it out slowly. You have to be invited in. Uh, it's early days. They don't index status or comments. They would like to do that, but that's a much bigger task uh, to include that amount of structured data. They're not doing a mobile version for similar reasons, and they're not putting ads on this. Now, a lot of people said that's because they're, you know, they're, they're shoveling all of this stuff to advertisers. Well, they always have been. Uh, the same data that is driving this search engine has been available to advertisers to target advertisements already. So all they're doing here is taking that and figuring out a, a way to present it to you as a user. One thing that uh, we talked to Andrew Sullivan of Search Engine Land yesterday, and he said it's interesting. What Google has done in most of the search engines is send out robotic spiders to find things. This actually searches based on what humans do, and that's that's a difference that we haven't really seen before. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's something uniquely uh, uh, available to a, a company with a large data set social company like Facebook. It's why Google starts at Google+. Plus. They would like to have that kind of data to use as well. Yes. Let's uh, talk about Twitter and the fact that uh, this time the copyright fight is going from Twitter to the news outlets instead of the other way around. Yeah, a uh, district judge over in New York City has ruled that uh, two news outlets, Agence uh, France Presse uh, and the Washington Post, infringed on the copyrights of a photographer named Daniel Morell using pictures that he took after the Haiti earthquake back in January of 2010. And it's a little convoluted what happened because you might say, well, you can't just take somebody's pictures no matter where they go. Morell put up the Haiti pictures on Twitter eventually. An AFP editor, that's the French publication, discovered them through another Twitter user's account, as these tend to do, distributed several of the pictures to Getty Images. The Washington Post, which is the Getty Images client, published four of the images on its website. Now, AFP had argued that once the pictures appeared on Twitter, they were freely available. Now, I'm sure that the publication doesn't actually think if you see something on Twitter, then that means it's up for grabs. It's that they were not uh, able to trace it back to the original photographer easily enough. So it's like, what are they to do? You know, if, if they find photos on someone else's user account and that person doesn't seem to have a problem with them using it, 
well, how do they really know? Yeah, when I the find full really? episodes of CSI linked on some Twitter account, I can't trace it back to the original. You say, did you I just, make the I just, show? I just, and they I just say assume yes. they did. Yeah, and so you say, okay. Uh, so I, yeah, I mean that's a pretty bad argument. Um, Morell is not getting exactly what he wanted out of it either. He had originally requested what the court said would amount to possibly tens of millions of dollars in statutory damages. Um, he's going to only uh, the the publications are only going to be liable for single statutory damage award per image infringed, and we're only talking about a few here. Uh, the judge also refused to grant Morell's motion for summary judgment on whether uh, these publications AFP getting and the Washington Post acted willfully and violated his rights under the uh, DMCA. Twitter's not a party in this case. Uh, a spokesperson said, hey, our policy is, is that Twitter users own their own photos. So this is, we had no part uh, in this um, and they weren't really dragged into the fight. But I think this is all very interesting because you hear about a story like this and you go, somebody posts his pictures on Twitter. I'm assuming it was a link back to something else, but you could you could upload the picture directly to Twitter if you wanted to. Now, there are lots of ways you can do that. There should be no reason that anyone should think that they can just lift it. I mean, something being on Twitter is no more than something being on Instagram or something being on Facebook. I mean, it's all the same idea. But then you have a service like, let's say, Flickr, for example. Flickr's pretty old school, but it's always been pretty good about being all rights reserved, Creative Commons, something in between. I, as the photographer, can set that. It's pretty easy for anyone to see how I've said it and and act accordingly. Twitter doesn't have anything like this. It is very much the Wild West. So I don't know. Is the answer to have some sort of a copyright uh, situation in place because Twitter wants to be, as we've seen, especially with their new uh, iPhone app, more and more about photos being uploaded directly to Twitter, not just about 140 characters. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a great, a great story, Sarah. And there's, there is so much to this. And we deal with this uh, as a news organization all the time on the receiving end, uh, as far as we see things posted on places like Flickr and Twitter. And I, I applaud Flickr for having those choices where you can, you know, put it up that way and say, hey, take it or, or no, I, I want to retain rights to this. And I think there should be more rules about that to make it clear to organizations, whether a you know, a network like NBC or, or perhaps a smaller blog, can you take these things? You know, if you're in uh, Egypt during the Arab Spring sending things out because the government has uh, censored you, you want things to be spread all over the place. And something like Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, whatever, that's, that's a great, great solution uh, to getting the news out. On the other hand, if you're this person, maybe, uh, you know, you feel more ownership to that. And that's legitimate, too. I'm surprised in this day and age of information and fo photographs getting sent out so quickly that there aren't more rules and more protocol. And it's almost up to each organization to say, well, we're not going to use it until we get permission. Um, but then there are always these things that slip through the cracks. Uh, I got an email recently from a lawyer saying, hey, you can be part of a class action lawsuit against Facebook because of images that might have been used. Uh, it's just it's still kind of the Wild West when it comes to these photographs. And I'm surprised. It seems like there should be more rules and regulations out there. Yeah, as Twitter's gotten larger and larger and added more tools like photo sharing and things like that, or photo hosting, that is, I mean, the, Twitter was built for sharing quickly. It wasn't It wasn't designed like Flickr was, which was pretty much a showcase for photographers where you would have these built-in options. When you would put up a photo, you had all of these, uh, well, you had options to say the copyright, give titles, dates, all kinds of things that you could do versus Twitter, which is basically like just post something as quickly as you can to the point where it is built into iOS and a number of operating systems where you could easily take a photo and pop it on Twitter before you know it. You don't know what happened to that photo. So the thing is, it, it's probably because of the nature of Twitter that people think, oh, yeah, it's free. As in, the, I don't really know how on earth uh, these news organizations thought this would be available to all when it's not in the Twitter terms of service, but it's it's just it shows how easy it is to share on Twitter. It's not really something that it was built to do for photos when it first started. What's the nature of the internet? Internet the internet was built on easy sharing. That that was what the World Wide Web uh, was created for as well as a way to easily share information. And so when we have old style copyright law run up against the new way of doing things, you're inevitably going to have these conflicts. Usually we've had them where users are taking things that they aren't supposed to take from big companies. It's interesting to see it goes the other way sometimes because the law is just a little too complicated, actually a lot too complicated and, and not adapted to this situation. 
Uh, let's. Uh, I've got the Facebook story. Sarah had the copyright stories. Tell me you've got a RIM or a Microsoft story, Ayaz. <laughs> it's, it's a weird I have a day. Google story. How about a Google story? Ah, you have a Google. Okay, go ahead. So it's kind of a, one of the big dogs there, but I'm going to talk about a more fun story than what you guys have today. So uh, we're talking about the, the Glass Foundry event. Google announced it's holding that two-day Google, Google Glass developer event in San Francisco and in New York. It's open to those who signed up for the $1,500 developer edition. And what you get when you go to this, assuming you get an invite, which are being sent out right now. I got one. De developers, oh, awesome. Developers will get access Humble to Glass. Time. And the Google Mirror API, that's what they're calling it, which is a collection of REST services uh, in a video announcing this, this event. Uh, they, Google explained that you could use PHP, Python, or even Java. They said that this is pretty much language independent. So when you go to this event, you'll be able to develop right off the bat. Invites, like I said, are being sent out right now. Uh, the San Francisco event is on January 28th and 29th. And the New York event is on February 2nd and excuse me, February 1st and 2nd. Scott, assuming that the developers are listening right now, what do you want to see out of this product? I know we're not, we're not going to necessarily have a, you know, augmented reality, but what do you want to see? I, that's such a good question, and I'm so glad they're opening up to developers. I it. It's fascinating, and I, I don't really know what we'll see, but I think there's some very bright minds out there that are going to give us uh, perhaps some mapping, perhaps some games, all the things that usually bring you into something. Um, and, uh, you know, a way to find friends, a way to find coffee shops, sort of like, remember that, that early, uh, demo, I guess. Um, and that seemed so far-fetched at the time. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what specific things come out of this because it's a specific technology that we haven't really had before. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for is, is how to take advantage of this. I guess you would call it a new platform maybe. Jason, you said you got an invite. Are you going to give it a go? Are you going to try to develop? Well, I mean, I read the invite and I was like, well, it kind of doesn't apply to me because I'm not a developer. What am I going to do? Go there and, and like <laughs> pretend to be a developer and then show them just how much I am not, you know? Um, but I did get an invite. Um, I'm curious once this all gets rolled out, I, I have to imagine Google's going to roll uh, functionality into uh, Scott Bubman. You just you just said something about games. Google has this really cool uh, game on Android right now called Ingress, which is all about kind of like you know, exploring your real world and getting out there and using your device to kind of explore these different places. I could totally see this kind of tying into that somehow, or maybe those types of games. Uh, I just hadn't considered that before. It's a cool thought. Jason, you can learn PHP in like two weeks. It oh, yeah. Be difficult. No problem. Uh, I'm going to take the next two weeks off. I as you're going to be switching the show, okay? <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Sarah, what do you think developers should be coming out with? I mean, it's easy that you could probably see a calendar or maybe even your emails, but is there something that you think that they should be working on to make Google Glass like a must have? I mean, all of the stuff to me, and and I have not been fortunate enough to try these extremely attractive glasses on. <laughs> you do um, not like the looks of those glasses. I do not like the looks of them. <laughs> I hate the look of them. But I also understand that it's a working prototype and whatever. But uh, it all sounds very distracting to me. I love the idea of, of, I mean, look at that. Come on. I do not want to wear that. Sorry. Does not look cool. I love the idea of having information, you know, at my, well, not really at my fingertips, right at my eyeballs without actually having to use my hands and pull out my phone and that sort of thing. But I don't think I really want to see a calendar out of the corner of my eyes. A lot of this stuff sounds like cool, interesting technology because we're trying to get somewhere with it. But in real world adoption, it just sounds strange to me. I know that there are developers out there who have some really great ideas. I think that that's, that's what's interesting about this. Um, I guess calendars and being able to, you know, take a photo that may or may not look good because it's a crappy lens is kind of interesting, but just the first step. Tom, hardware aside, what software do you think should be on this? I want maps. I want maps with Ooh. an arrow right in front of my face. And I want them, I want those internal maps, like when you're like in a mall or a bus station or, or somewhere like that. And yeah, and I want to find, you know, the the shawarma place, and it just points me there, and I just follow the the arrows on the ground that aren't really there. They're just I, that's what I want. <laughs> 
That, it's only, not the only thing I want, but that, that's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, I also want an easier way to scan my 35 millimeter film. This is honest. This is honestly true. Yep. I'm also making a transition into the next story, but sure. we have a bunch of 35 millimeter film that I was packing up when I moved recently, and I was like, God, I wish there was an easy way to scan this. I've got the same thing. I saw this on Tumblr last night, and I was really excited about it because I, too, have not one, not two, but several boxes of old print, 35 millimeter photography, and also the original negatives, yep. which are actually the most important part of it. The Lamography Smart Foam Film Scanner is going to be the answer, Tom and I and anybody else who has boxes like this. It's a scanner and app combo, combo so you can digitally archive a ton of 35 millimeter film negatives that you might just have laying around or, you know, maybe never even print it out. You know, it's, it's, it's for, for anybody who's got negatives. You put the film to the scanner, you turn on the backlight, and then it'll take a photo using your smartphone, uh, available for iOS and Android, or will be when it's out. The ETA is March 2013. Again, this is just a Kickstarter project right now. And then the app allows users to edit and, and share the scanned images. Now, the folks who make this, the Lomography folks, say that the scans uh, that the device makes or at a quality acceptable for archiving and sharing and printing. Now, when you go to the Kickstarter page, they have a very nice um, layout of exactly what you can expect and how the device is made. And by the way, they've reached their goal uh, and then some, but you still have 18 days to go if you wanted to be one of the first people who gets this off the production line, assuming that it still comes out in the next couple of months. But they, they have a lot of uh, uh, examples of what photos look like. Some of those photos, to me, don't look amazing. I used to work at a camera processing place, so I you know I know how to clean up uh, uh, colors uh, when, when something doesn't look quite as good as possible. Some of this stuff looks a little Instagram-y to me, like, hmm, interesting filters. But again, if there's a really good app that's bundled in with this that can help clean up photos... You can sharpen, you can change the tone. I mean, you probably have a lot of options as, as we all do already on our smartphones. But I love the idea. I love the idea of an easy way to digitally archive all of the stuff because what's your other option? You have a standalone scanner, you put your print down one by one, you know, I, it, that's, I've tried to do that before and it's like, you can't do that with, you know, a thousand photos. That would be a year long project in all your free time. So if you pledge 60 or more still at the Kickstarter project, again, even though they've uh, reached their goal, um, you can basically get get one of the first out of the assembly line, as they put it. I have pledged. I am very excited about this. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that I cannot wait to try out because not only is it just sort of fun and geeky and photography stuff, but it's something that I truly do need. I, I, I'm, I'm carting around this stuff. I, I don't think I'm going to throw away my negatives necessarily, but I can certainly feel like uh, I've I've backed them up a lot more uh, intelligently. Add them to your digital archive. That's right. Yeah. Anyone? Scott, what do you what do you think? Is this something you would use? I mean, there's also you could drop them by the uh, the counter yeah. at the at the department store too. I think this is a great idea, um, and I agree with Sarah. What else are you going to do? What's your other option? There aren't all that many options now. It's interesting. This is taking. You know, a use of technology to take something from the old school and bring it into the new. It's almost like those uh, uh, machines, even record players, that will take your vinyl records and transfer them over into MP3s, which, of course, make the music purists howl. But while musicians and music fans, audiophiles, still have record players to play that vinyl if you want, there really is nothing to do with all those photographs that are in all those boxes. And those are pretty much just not going to be seen unless there's a way to do something like this. So I applaud this and I say, give it a try, uh, simply because as Sarah said, what, what's the other option? Leaving them in the boxes and having all those photos of, you know, perhaps older relatives or, or past memories just kind of sit there. Um, and that's the, the plus and the minus of the, of the digital age is it's so convenient, but everything we have is kind of recent. And it's nice to be able to go back and, and have those things uh, very easily on your phone so you can send them away and, you know, email them and, and all that stuff. And that makes such a big difference. So this should be really cool. And, and I, I think this is an even better use of that than uh, trying to make everything into an MP3. 60 bucks, not a bad price point, AIS. No, not at all. $60 doesn't sound bad at all for this single function kind of thing, especially if you've got a lot of film laying around. I know I was going through boxes and boxes, and I found some stuff from college. So I do have 35 millimeter film sitting around. It also does, I believe, if you had um, motion pictures 35 millimeter, it'll, it'll stitch them together to make a little stop motion video if you wanted. 
Although I don't think it does the audio. Uh, it, it seems like a really cool idea, but it also, like, like everyone's been saying, it, it shows how basically crappy scanners have been. Because unless you have a dedicated machine to do a negative scan, or if you have a desktop scanner, it's kind of, it's this single function device that's not exactly exciting because it's just scanning your files. I know I have, I'm, sitting, I'm looking at my scanner right now, which is not connected because it's a hassle. And the funny thing is taking a photograph is just simpler. It'll get your stuff done quicker instead of having to go out and try to get somebody else to do it. I think, I think it, it's going to appeal to a lot of people who are nostalgic and want to get rid of those boxes and boxes of uh, negatives. Yeah, and be able to do it themselves. I mean, I, I think that's the thing. A lot of people want to have control of this. They don't want to drop it off at a Costco or a CVS and, and, and have their negatives out of their control. It's also going to be more expensive to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, significantly you know? more expensive. I mean, you, the time it takes you to, you're going to have to want to sort of think this project is fun. That's true. Because it will take a lot of time, but it's a lot more cost effective to do it yourself. And you can make it kind of a fun family project. Sure. It helps you rediscover along the way. Yeah. Nintendo's trying to make things more cost effective as well. Uh, I, I asked, what's going on here? Is this just shuffling the deck chairs? I, w I, w I don't think they have deck chairs at, at Nintendo. I'm not really sure yet. <laughs> uh, Nintendo, they're confir they've confirmed plans to merge its console and handheld divisions into a single unit on February 16th. Now, there was a report initially broken by Nikkei that was confirmed by Nintendo to Games Industry International. Now, the two arms of the business will be together in, in a new Kyoto office, and this is supposed to streamline development of current consoles. The 3DS and the Wii U are probably going to get closer together. Uh, they're going to have one knowledge pool to draw from. Scott, what, what, what kind of lessons can one division learn from the other? It's a good question. I kind of think this is a good move just out of necessity. The idea of a console has changed so much just being at CES and seeing what everybody is doing. You've got companies like NVIDIA coming out with its own console, but it's really a portable game system. You have Razer coming out with a tablet sized, what they call a console, but it's really a portable game system. Nintendo has to make this move towards the, the portable. Um, and I, I it just makes sense, and, and I think we're sort of redefining and rethinking what a game console is and how people want to take their games with them, whether on a tablet or a phone or something a little more formal, if you will. Uh, but this is a good move by Nintendo because there was almost this feeling um, at past events and past consumer electronics shows that they were falling a bit behind. And if they have a hit with the Wii U, um, I think that has to be considered their console, even though it is a portable gaming device. I think the two thoughts and the two worlds are merging together so it sort of makes sense for them to do that i think tom do you think that we're going to see really tight nintendo 3ds uh integration with the wii u because the wii u that that tablet con uh, the tablet controller is effectively almost a, it's almost a portable console except it doesn't have the guts to do that yeah i the reason i asked if this was rearranging deck chairs on the nintendo titanic is uh i not not that i don't think that the Wii U folks could learn something from the 3DS folks. The 3DS seems fairly successful, but I, I just wonder that what I, Nintendo's problems are are deeper, uh, that, that they, they need to embrace an entirely new way of doing things. And mobile gaming on your smartphone is what's out there. And, and so as good as the 3DS is right now, that is, uh, that is the PDA uh, of our marketplace right now. It's got, a, it's got an end of life on it, in my opinion. Uh, the Wii U is not being received with with huge enthusiasm uh and and they need to come up with a different strategy overall maybe this is just the first step towards coming up with that strategy is all right let's consolidate these teams together and take the best out of them and create that new strategy i hope that's what they mean sarah do you think that this is going to give nintendo a shot in the arm is this going to be like the the handheld guys going what have you guys been doing with the console you're ruining our systems it makes sense for Nintendo to consolidate at the same time when I read this I think Nintendo is going to fire a bunch of people yeah well yeah. you know I mean they're consolidating and that makes sense but this is sort of a downsize like hey you know what we're we're running two different businesses that we shouldn't be running and they're probably both a little bit bloated so let's try to be smarter this is what Nintendo should be doing in my opinion and should have probably been doing a long time ago but uh but it, it's this doesn't sound like growth to me. This sounds like a stopgap um, to what may come in the future if Nintendo doesn't get um, on the mobile train and fast. You know, it surprised me that they even had separate divisions. You think these? I mean, they make games and they make consoles, and they should work together. 
Uh, the fact that they were siloed and separated seemed a little strange. If they can get these two things together and they could make them work together in a way that, I don't know if they make them essential to each other, but very complementary, uh, similar to the way the PS uh, Vita works with the PS3, which is not exactly the greatest combination in the world, but Nintendo has, a low, has very low cost hardware. So I think they might have a chance, but like Tom said, it's kind of the PDA of, of uh, games right now because it's the only thing Nintendo does is games and they need, or consoles, they need to move beyond that in today's world. It'll uh, be a lot easier to become a software-only company if all your console and hardware stuff's in one place too. You need, you need to shut it down later. Hope that doesn't happen. Uh, finally, let's talk about Bob, the guy... <laughs> Uh, that Verizon, now he didn't work for Verizon. Verizon's security blog published a case study because they said this isn't a widespread problem, but they thought it was fairly interesting. Uh, he worked at a critical infrastructure company that they did not name, supposedly outsourced several jobs. He was doing jobs for many different companies uh, and hired a consulting company, they think in Shenyang, but definitely in China, uh, paid him $50,000 a year to do all his coding for him. Uh, and here is Bob's day as revealed by forensics on his browsing history. 9 a.m. he would arrive to work, sit down at his desk, surf Reddit for a couple hours, watch some cat videos. 11.30 a.m. take some lunch. 1 p.m. back at the desk, do some eBaying. Uh, around 2 o'clock or so, Facebook updates and LinkedIn. 4.30, uh, update emails to management, uh, I guess on what the Chinese consulting company had turned around for him that day. And then 5 p.m. head home. Is no, this uh, irresponsible sound, or brilliant? It doesn't sound unlike some of the days that I have enjoyed in the past. <laughs> I'm not saying today is one of Wait, those days. Are but you Sarah or a Chinese consulting company right now? I'm saying that some of this I can say is research. You know, you got to know what the top cat memes are sure. for the social hour on Friday. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to laugh. I mean, it's kind of brilliant. It's too bad he got caught. What, was the Chinese <laughs> consulting company doing a good job? Apparently, he got rave reviews. All his employee so reviews were top notch. I think the company is is a little misguided here. They well, should be thanking him. Here's the problem: they discovered it because they found this VPN connection coming from Xinjiang, China, and they said, "Well, we do, do we have a zero day attack? Is this a malware? How is how are they breaking into our VPN?" They eventually traced it back to the fact that this guy had sent his key fob, his RSA key fob for VPN, to Xinjiang to the consulting company, uh, and that's a security risk, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, and that's what sticks out is obviously it's a big security risk other than that. And, of course, that is a big other than. It is brilliant. I agree. We we all knew people who did this in the pre-digital age. You know, they'd hire out some kid to do their work for them uh, while they kicked back and did, uh, you know, whatever the uh, cat video of the day was. But, yeah, I get it. They're concerned because it's a security risk. Um, but, yeah, other than that, not bad. And I wonder what he was making that he could outsource the work for, what, $50,000, you said, or was it $50 an hour? No, sorry, they, he was making several hundred thousand dollars a year, wow. and he was charging okay. the consulting company $50,000 a year. Well, there you go. So he still made big bucks to uh, surf the nothing. web. To do nothing. Right. And, um, you know, the, the only downside, of course, is that, yeah, you're opening up the, uh, the keys to an outside, and I mean outside the country, uh, <laughs> consultant. And so, yeah, I can see where Verizon would be concerned. That's the kind of thing you, you want to do without getting caught, but eventually, hey, it's the digital age. Someone is going to find out. And, I, uh, has, I haven't seen you in person for a few days. <laughs> Are you doing this right now? Right now, yeah. I've task rabbited everything, actually. Uh, all my notes, all the news fuses, uh, even what I'm saying right now, it's written on a, on a teleprompter right there. Uh, but no, I, I have not been doing this yet. I, I've thought about this, you know, outsourcing certain parts of my life thanks to things like TaskRabbit out there. But it's really interesting to see somebody pulling this off. Although I would think that Verizon probably looked at this kind of thing on their own, saying, hey, how much of this can we outsource? Do we have security concerns? Are we going to run to any government opposition if we did this ourselves? And probably came to the conclusion, no, we can't outsource this <laughs> because if we did it, we'd get in a lot of trouble. So Bob, being very being an entrepreneur, I mean that's it's kind of a brilliant idea. But if it's causing uh, if it's causing you know maybe security concerns, yeah, maybe not the brightest idea. As Sarah said earlier in the show, wow, Bob, <laughs> <laughs> several hundred thousand dollars a year, not bad. I mean, geez, yeah, I'd work pretty hard for that too. He's just following an efficient marketplace. Wow, you know. Security. Well, That's lucrative. Well done, Bob. Oh. Sorry you got fired. Uh, hopefully you <laughs> saved up a lot of that money. <laughs> Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer.
Uh, Ayaz, did you? Was it you who found this soda drinking game? Uh, yes, Amanda, I did. Amanda Kuzer on CNET has this. It's a uh, it's a game where you virtually drink soda called Soda Drinker Pro for Mac or PC. Yes, that's right. Uh, it, it's a real game, and uh, I was reading the article and looking into this, and uh, pretty much. Uh, the, the writer of the article explained that trying to download it is kind of, you have to throw away everything you know about, uh, well, security at all. <laughs> Not a good idea. Google can't scan it for viruses because it's too big. And uh, the person, uh, the author tried it out and it is exactly what it says it is. It's a soda drinker simulation. Uh, it's supposed to have like 100 levels. The maker promised to put Soda Drinker Pro on Steam Greenlight with, get this, 100 levels of nonstop soda drinking action. Um, this is, I can't tell if this was a joke that just went wrong or like, or, or what, but the website for Soda Drinker Pro is astonishingly uh, old looking. It is incredible. I was just shocked that this even exists. You want I, Is anyone so into soda that this sounds really fun? Like I want to think about soda more. Diabetics. I want to really put a lot of effort into in, Bob into probably had time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob probably wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> this is what Bob is was code? doing, you know, in between drinking cafes. soda. Yeah. <laughs> I think we caught on to Bob's new project. You're right. <laughs> soda simulation needs. We've all got them. Yep. Yeah, it's a, you want to stop drinking so much soda? That's, that's yeah, what Amanda This is a cessation play technique. Soda drinker pro yeah. instead. Sure. Yeah. They should do that for cigarettes, too. They, I, there, there have been virtual cigarettes. Really? That you can, Not you can as put a on your desktop. Yeah. Take a little break. Yeah. Oh, wow. Play a little game. I used to have one on my Windows 98 PC. <laughs> Did it, it feel good? It was a little desktop thing, take, and you take watched it burn. And really? Play. No, it didn't do anything. Okay, I was yeah. going to say. There's no nicotine. That almost seems like a tease mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, I, think I gotta I, go! I think that Soda Drinker <laughs> Pro probably does the same thing. It just makes you thirsty. I go outside. Let's see what's on I would like a pie uh, eating pro like i would like a simulator of that because I, I would just eat pie all day anyway so why yeah. not all kinds of foods you should branch out soda drinker pro yeah move to everywhere else pie eater pro <laughs> let's see what's on the calendar temple run 2 is launching on iphones and ipads tonight uh leo and i will definitely be talking about that on ipad today which we shoot tomorrow on thursday also tomorrow january 17th the source 13 mobile conference is happening in san francisco at the metreon and the freedom to connect conference is happening on march 4th and 5th in silver spring maryland uh some great speakers vince surf our very own jeff jarvis host of this week in google will both be speaking and the reason I'm talking about it so far in advance is because the early bird price for the conference expires on January 18th. So that's just a couple days from now. So if you're interested, now's the time to get your tickets. Go to freedom-2-connect.net. Correct. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We've got a message from Paul. Regarding your discussion about new online courses being offered, I took an accounting class at the University of Central Florida that used Second Life as a way to get students to interact with one another. I'll admit it was a little odd at first, but it did actually get me to interact with other students as we solved problems involving balance sheets and the like. Additionally, we could watch lectures and other avatars and ask each other questions about what we were seeing. While it may have been an odd way of doing things, I felt it really did help make the students in a large online class interact with one another in a more productive manner. That's a really interesting way to get people to communicate in classes, huh? Yeah, I mean, people think of Second Life as as, as flying obscenities uh, a lot, but it has some ha and still does have uh, some great educational uses. So thanks for that, Paul. Got another email from Juan at the programmer who says, how could you have missed the whole point of Facebook's graph search? Uh-oh. Zuck is a genius. It's not for end user at all. It's just another way for Facebook to sell your information. It's just hiding in plain sight. He says it's for people to use, but in reality, it's for advertisers and marketers. Once people start sharing more data, companies will be able to do searches and allow Facebook to sell groups of people for advertising. Think about it. If I'm in a business, I could ask Facebook to show my ad to 18 to 25-year-olds who like barbecue and football and beer who live within 20 miles of the D.C. area. It's brilliant. This is why Zuck is not putting in the mobile version of the site. I could be wrong, but in the meantime, I'm unliking everything. I'm removing all check-ins, tags of myself, and seriously thinking about closing my account. Well, Juan, news, news to you. They've been doing what you described for a long, is, long time. Yeah, this that, is not a secret. Yeah. They're just finally letting you use that stuff. That's what we were mentioning earlier. Right. So 
if if this bothers you, then you should have been not tagging and closing things a while ago. Yeah, it, it's Facebook might be the place for you. That's what Facebook does. Yeah. You just described their business model pretty much. <laughs> uh, and finally, some thoughts on Thunderbolt. Michael says there's always going to be a cost problem. I don't know if this is specifically required, but so far, every Thunderbolt connection requires four dedicated chips. That's one on each device and one on each end of the cable. That's a huge cost disadvantage compared to USB 3, but you get a much more stable connection. Furthermore, right now, there's very few cases where consumers are about to take advantage of that connection. Unless you're running serious RAID arrays, the difference between 5 gigabits per second and 10 gigabits per second throughput doesn't mean much. As someone who does HD video processing and likes to work with many monitors and drives, it's huge. However, I don't think I'm an average computer user. Uh, that's okay. I like my RAID arrays. Uh, so I, I think Michael kind of showing some more evidence that Thunderbolt may end up being the firewire of the modern age uh, used by pros because it is technically better, but it's a little more expensive and USB will catch on with the masses. Well, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, Scott Budman, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Let folks know where they can, they can find you online and, and on air. Uh, sure, you can find me on air here on uh, NBC Bay Area, uh, 5 and 6, sometimes 11. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Budman. Send story ideas, anything you have. And uh, thanks, you guys. It's always fun to be part of this. And you can suggest stories to us on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Or email us, uh, tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Bob Levitas. We'll see you then.